Foundations of Maternal Newborn and Women's Health Nursing by Murray, McKinney, Holub, and Jones, 7th edition. Chapter 18, Postpartum Maternal Complications. Pregnancy and childbirth are natural events from which most women recover without complication. However, nurses should be aware of problems that may occur and their effect on the family. The most common physiologic complications during the postpartum period are hemorrhage, thromboembolic disorders, and infection, peripartum mood and anxiety disorders, the major psychological disorders during childbearing are discussed in chapter 11. Postpartum hemorrhage. Postpartum hemorrhage is a major cause of maternal death and morbidity in the United States and the world. Traditionally, postpartum hemorrhage was defined as blood loss greater than 500 milliliters for vaginal birth and greater than 1,000 milliliters for a cesarean birth. However, the Nomenclature Consensus Conference of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists revised the definition of early postpartum hemorrhage as cumulative blood loss of greater or equal than 1,000 milliliters or blood loss accompanied by signs and symptoms of hypovolemia within 24 hours following the birth process includes intrapartum loss. Blood loss is frequently underestimated. Estimates are often only about half the actual loss, and therefore blood loss should be quantified by weighing or measuring and records of cumulative loss maintained. Hemorrhage in the first 24 hours after childbirth is called early postpartum hemorrhage. Hemorrhage after 24 hours or up to 6 to 12 weeks after birth is called late postpartum hemorrhage. Early postpartum hemorrhage. Early postpartum hemorrhage usually occurs during the first hour after birth and is most often caused by uterine atony. Atony refers to lack of muscle tone that results in failure of the uterine muscle fibers to contract firmly around blood vessels when the placenta separates. Trauma to the birth canal during labor and birth, hematomas, localized collections of blood in a space or tissue, retention of placental fragments, and abnormalities of coagulation are other causes. Hemorrhage from disseminated intravascular coagulation and placenta previa are discussed in Chapter 10. Other causes of hemorrhage include placenta accreta, abnormal adherence of the placenta to the uterine wall, and inversion of the uterus, which is described in Chapter 16. Uterine atony. With uterine atony, the relaxed muscles allow rapid bleeding from the endometrial arteries at the placental site. Bleeding continues until the uterine muscle fibers contract to stop the flow of blood. Figure 18.1 illustrates the effect of uterine contraction on the size of the placental site and the amount of bleeding that occurs. Predisposing factors. Knowledge of factors that increase the risk for uterine atony helps the nurse anticipate and therefore reduce excessive bleeding. Overdistension of the uterus from any cause such as multiple gestation, a large infant, or hydramnios, excessive volume of amniotic fluid, makes it more difficult for the uterus to contract with enough firmness to prevent excessive bleeding. Multiparity results in muscle fibers that have been stretched repeatedly, and these flaccid muscle fibers may not remain contracted after birth. Obesity also increases the risk for postpartum hemorrhage. Intrapartum factors include contractions that were minimally effective, resulting in prolonged labor, contractions that were excessively vigorous, resulting in precipitous labor, and labor that was induced or augmented with oxytocin. Retention of a large segment of the placenta does not allow the uterus to contract firmly and therefore can result in uterine atony. Box 18.1 summarizes predisposing factors for postpartum hemorrhage. Clinical manifestations. Major signs of uterine atony include the following. A uterine fundus that is difficult to locate. A soft or boggy feel when the fundus is located. A uterus that becomes firm as it is massaged but loses its tone when the massage is stopped. A fundus that is located above the expected level. Excessive lochia, especially if it is bright red. Excessive clots expelled either with or without uterine massage. For the first 24 hours after childbirth, the uterus should feel like a firmly contracted ball roughly the size of a large grapefruit. It should be easily located at about the level of the umbilicus. Lochia should be dark red and scant to moderate in amount. Saturation of one parapad in 15 minutes represents an excessive blood loss. The nurse should realize that although bleeding may be profuse and dramatic, a constant steady trickle, dribble, or slow seeping 
is just as dangerous. Therapeutic management. Early administration of oxytocin is recommended for all births as a prophylaxis against postpartum hemorrhage. IV infusion of dilute oxytocin, not IV push, should be given during the third stage of labor. Oxytocin also may be administered intramuscularly. Nurses are with the mother during the hours after childbirth and are responsible for assessments and initial management of uterine atony. If the uterus is not firmly contracted, despite preventative measures, the first intervention is to massage the fundus until it is firm and to express clots that may have accumulated in the uterus. One hand is placed just above the symphysis pubis to support the lower uterine segment, while the other hand gently but firmly massages the fundus in a circular motion. Clots that may have accumulated in the uterine cavity interfere with the ability of the uterus to contract effectively. They are expressed by applying firm but gentle pressure on the fundus in the direction of the vagina. It is critical that the uterus is contracted firmly before attempting to express clots. Pushing on a uterus that is not contracted could invert the uterus and cause massive hemorrhage and rapid shock. If the uterus does not remain contracted as a result of uterine massage or if the fundus is displaced, the bladder may be distended. A full bladder lifts the uterus, moving it up and to the side, preventing effective contraction of the uterine muscles. Assist the mother to urinate or catheterize her to correct uterine atony caused by bladder distension. Note urine output. If atony persists despite prophylactic oxytocin and uterine massage, further pharmacologic measures may be necessary. Initially, additional oxytocin may be ordered. Methergine, methylogonavine, is a common second drug of choice when oxytocin is not effective. Methergine elevates blood pressure and should not be given to a woman who is hypertensive. The usual route of administration is intramuscularly. Misoprostol, Cytotec, a synthetic prostaglandin E1, PGE1, given orally or sublingually, also may be used to control bleeding. Analogs of prostaglandin F2-alpha, PGF2A, carbopost tromethamine, hemabate prostin 15M, are also effective when given intramuscularly or into the uterine muscle. If uterine massage and pharmacologic measures are ineffective in stopping uterine bleeding, the healthcare provider may use bimanual compression of the uterus. In this procedure, one hand is inserted into the vagina and the other compresses the uterus through the abdominal wall. A balloon may be inserted into the uterus to apply pressure against the uterine surface to stop bleeding. Uterine packing also may be used. It may be necessary to return the woman to the birthing area for exploration of the uterine cavity and removal of placental fragments that interfere with uterine contraction. A laparotomy may be necessary to identify the source of the bleeding. Uterine compression sutures may be placed to stop severe bleeding. Ligation of the uterine or hypogastric artery or embolization occlusion of pelvic arteries may be required if other measures are not effective. Hysterectomy is a last resort to save the life of a woman with uncontrollable postpartum hemorrhage. Hemorrhage requires prompt replacement of intravascular fluid volume, lactated ringer solution, whole blood, packed red blood cells, normal saline, or other plasma extenders are used. Enough fluid should be given to maintain a urine flow of at least 30 milliliters per hour. Typically, the nurse is responsible for obtaining properly typed and cross-matched blood and inserting large-bore IV lines capable of carrying whole blood. Trauma. Trauma to the birth canal is the second most common cause of early postpartum hemorrhage. Trauma includes vaginal, cervical, or perineal lacerations and hematomas. Predisposing factors. Many of the same factors that increase the risk for uterine atony increase the risk for soft tissue trauma during childbirth. For example, trauma to the birth canal is more likely to occur if the infant is large or if labor and birth occur rapidly. Induction and augmentation of labor and use of assistive devices such as a vacuum extractor or forceps increase the risk for tissue trauma. Lacerations. 
The perineum, vagina, cervix, and area around the urethral meatus are the most common sites for lacerations. Small cervical lacerations occur frequently and generally do not require repairs. Lacerations of the vagina, perineum, and periurethral area usually occur during the second stage of labor, when the fetal head descends rapidly or when assistive devices such as a vacuum extractor or forceps are used to aid in birth. Lacerations of the birth canal should be suspected if excessive uterine bleeding continues when the fundus is contracted firmly and is at the expected location. Bleeding from lacerations of the genital tract often is bright red, in contrast to the darker color of lochia. Bleeding may be heavy or may appear to be minor with a steady trickle of blood. Hematomas. Hematomas occur when bleeding into loose connective tissue occurs while overlying tissue remains intact. Hematomas develop as a result of blood vessel injury in spontaneous deliveries and deliveries in which vacuum extractors or forceps are used. Hematomas may be found in vulvar, vaginal, and retroperitoneal areas. The rapid bleeding into soft tissue may cause a visible vulvar hematoma, a discolored bulging mass that is sensitive to touch. Hematomas in the vagina or retroperitoneal areas cannot be seen. Hematomas produce deep, severe, unrelieved pain and feelings of pressure that are not relieved by usual pain relief measures. Formation of a hematoma should be suspected if the mother demonstrates systemic signs of concealed blood loss, such as tachycardia or decreasing blood pressure, when the fundus is firm and lochia is within normal limits. Therapeutic management. When postpartum hemorrhage is caused by trauma of the birth canal, surgical repair is often necessary. Visualizing lacerations of the vagina or cervix is difficult, and it is necessary to return the mother to the birthing area, where surgical lights are available. She is placed in a lithotomy position and carefully draped. Surgical asepsis is required while the laceration is being visualized and repaired. Small hematomas usually resorb naturally. Large hematomas may require incision, evacuation of the clots, and location and ligation of the bleeding vessel. Late postpartum hemorrhage. Late postpartum hemorrhage, also called secondary postpartum hemorrhage, is defined as hemorrhage occurring between 24 hours and 12 weeks after birth. The most common causes of late postpartum hemorrhage are subinvolution, delayed return of the uterus to its non-pregnant size and consistency, retained placental fragments, and infection. Normally, the uterus descends at the rate of approximately one centimeter, one finger breadth per day, by 14 days, it is no longer palpable above the symphysis pubis. The endometrial lining has sloughed off as part of the lochia, and the site of placental attachment is well healed by six weeks after childbirth. When placental fragments are retained, clots form around the retained fragments, and excessive bleeding can occur when the clots slough away several days after birth. Clinical Manifestations Signs of subinvolution include prolonged discharge of lochia, irregular or excessive uterine bleeding, and sometimes profuse hemorrhage, pelvic pain or feelings of pelvic heaviness, backache, fatigue, and persistent malaise are reported by many women. On bimanual examination, the uterus feels larger and softer than normal for the time of the purpureum. Predisposing Factors Attempts to deliver the placenta before it separates from the uterine wall. Manual removal of the placenta. Placenta accreta. Previous cesarean birth and uterine leiomyomas are primary predisposing factors for retention of placental fragments. De Bos Le Grand, Riviere, Dussault, and Venditelli, 2015, found that early postpartum hemorrhage and advanced maternal age, 35 years or older, were also risk factors. Therapeutic management. Late postpartum hemorrhage caused by retained placental fragments is generally preventable. When the placenta is delivered, the healthcare provider carefully inspects it to determine whether it is intact. If a portion of the placenta is missing, the provider manually explores the uterus, locates the missing fragments, and removes them. Initial treatment for late postpartum hemorrhage is directed toward control of the excessive bleeding. Oxytocin, methergine, and prostaglandins are the most commonly used pharmacologic measures. 
Placental fragments may be dislodged and swept out of the uterus by the bleeding, and if the bleeding subsides when oxytocin is administered, no other treatment is necessary. Sonography may identify placental fragments that remain in the uterus. If bleeding continues or recurs, dilation and curatage, stretching of the cervical os to permit suctioning or scraping of the walls of the uterus, may be necessary to remove fragments. Broad-spectrum antibiotics may be given if postpartum infection is suspected because of uterine tenderness, foul-smelling lochia, or fever. Nursing considerations. In most cases, sub-involution is not obvious until the mother has returned home after childbirth. Nurses should teach the mother and her family how to recognize its occurrence. Demonstrate how to locate and palpate the fundus, and how to estimate fundal height in relation to the umbilicus. The uterus should become smaller each day by approximately one finger breadth. Explain the progressive changes from Lochia rubra to Lochia serosa and then to Lochia alba. See chapter 17. Instruct the mother to report any deviation from the expected pattern or duration of Lochia. A foul odor often indicates uterine infection for which treatment is necessary. Additional signs include pelvic or fundal pain, backache, and feelings of pelvic pressure or fullness. The mother should be able to verbalize the warning signs before leaving the facility. Hypovolemic shock. During and after giving birth, the woman can tolerate blood loss that approaches the volume of blood added during pregnancy, 1,500 to 2,000 ml. A woman who was anemic before birth has less reserve than a mother with normal blood values. The amount of blood loss can be estimated by comparing the hematocrit before labor to that after birth. If the hematocrit is lower after birth, the woman lost the amount of blood added during pregnancy plus an additional 500 milliliters for each 3% drop in the hematocrit value. When blood loss is excessive, hypovolemic shock, acute peripheral circulatory failure resulting from loss of circulating blood volume, can ensue. Hypovolemia, abnormally decreased volume of circulating fluid in the body, endangers vital organs by depriving them of oxygen. The brain, heart, and kidneys are especially vulnerable to hypoxia and may suffer damage in a brief period. Pathophysiology. Recognition of hypovolemic shock should be delayed because the body activates compensatory mechanisms that mask the severity of the problem. Baroreceptors are stimulated to constrict peripheral blood vessels. This shunts blood to the central circulation and away from less essential organs such as skin and extremities. The skin becomes pale and cold, but cardiac output and perfusion of vital organs are maintained. The adrenal glands release catecholamines, which compensate for decreased blood volume by promoting vasoconstriction in non-essential organs, increasing the heart rate and raising the blood pressure. As a result, blood pressure remains normal initially, although a decrease in pulse pressure, difference between systolic and diastolic blood pressures, may be noted. The tachycardia that develops is an early sign of compensation for excessive blood loss. As shock worsens, the compensatory mechanisms fail and physiologic insults spiral. Inadequate organ perfusion and decreased cellular oxygen for metabolism result in a buildup of lactic acid and the development of metabolic acidosis. Acidosis results in vasodilation, which further increases bleeding. Eventually, circulating volume becomes insufficient to perfuse cardiac and brain tissue. Cellular death occurs as a result of anoxia, and the mother dies. Clinical Manifestation Early signs of blood loss, such as mild tachycardia or hypotension, may not appear until 25-30% to 30 of the woman's blood volume has been lost. Tachycardia is one of the earliest signs of hypovolemic shock. Even gradual increases in the pulse rate should be noted. A decrease in blood pressure and narrowing of pulse pressure occur when the circulating volume of blood is sufficiently decreased. The respiratory rate increases as the woman becomes more anxious and attempts to take in more oxygen to overcome the need created when hemoglobin is inadequate to transport oxygen adequately. Skin changes also provide early clues. Vasoconstriction in the skin causes it to become pale and cool to the touch. As hemorrhage worsens, the skin changes become more obvious as pallor increases, and the skin becomes cold and clammy. As shock progresses, 
Changes occur in the central nervous system. The mother becomes anxious, then confused, and finally lethargic as blood loss increases. Urine output decreases and eventually stops. Therapeutic management. The goals of therapy are to control bleeding and prevent hypovolemic shock from being irreversible. A second IV line should be inserted with a large bore, 14 to 18 gauge, catheter, capable of carrying whole blood. Central IV catheters may be placed. Sufficient fluid volume is infused to produce a urinary output of at least 30 milliliters per hour. Vasopressors may be needed for low blood pressure. The healthcare team makes every effort to locate the source of bleeding and to stop the loss of blood. Nursing considerations, immediate care, multidisciplinary work groups of the National Partnership for Maternal Safety under the guidance of the Council on Patient Safety and Women's Health Care outline critical clinical practices called safety bundles that should be implemented in every maternity unit to address obstetric hemorrhage. These practices fall into four categories. Readiness, immediate access to supplies and medications, identification of a response team, and the method for immediate communication, protocols for emergency blood transfusions, staff education with regular drills. Recognition and prevention, risk assessment at multiple times during the antepartum, intrapartum, and postpartum periods, quantification of blood loss, early postpartum administration of oxytocin, response, an emergency management plan for obstetric hemorrhage, support programs for patient families and staff, and reporting and system learning, culture of safety, including huddles and debriefs, multidisciplinary quality reviews of hemorrhages with ongoing monitoring of outcomes and practice changes. These practices should be used to facilitate implementation of evidence-based practices to decrease severe maternal morbidity and mortality. When postpartum hemorrhage is identified, the response team should be notified. One person should be assigned to evaluate and record vital signs. Blood pressure and pulse should be assessed every three to five minutes. The location and consistency of the fundus, amount of lochia, skin temperature and color, and capillary return are assessed. Oxygen may be administered by tight face mask at eight to 10 liters per minute to increase the saturation of fewer red blood cells. Oxygen saturation levels are carefully monitored. Nurses often follow protocols that allow them to draw blood for hemoglobin, hematocrit, clotting studies, and type and cross-match. Nurses administer fluids, blood products, whole blood, and medications as directed and report their effectiveness. A urinary catheter is inserted to measure hourly urinary output. The catheter is also necessary if a surgical procedure to control the hemorrhage is required. In addition, nurses should make every effort to provide information and emotional support to the woman and her family. Safety check. Signs of postpartum hemorrhage include the following. A uterus that does not contract or does not remain contracted. Large gush or slow steady trickle, ooze or dribble of blood from the vagina. Saturation of one parapad per 15 minutes. Severe unrelieved perineal or rectal pain, tachycardia. Application of the nursing process. The woman with excessive bleeding. The initial postpartum assessment includes a chart review to determine whether risk factors for hemorrhage are present. This alerts the nurse to a woman at increased risk for hemorrhage. Uterine atony. Priority assessments for uterine atony include the fundus, bladder, lochia, vital signs, skin temperature, and color. Assess the consistency and the location of the uterine fundus. The fundus should be firmly contracted at or near the level of the umbilicus and midline. If the fundus feels soft, boggy, the uterus is not firmly contracted and bleeding from the placental site may be rapid and continuous. If the fundus is above the level of the umbilicus and displaced, a full bladder may be the cause of excessive bleeding. Assist the mother to urinate or obtain an order and catheterize her. Note urine output and then reassess the uterus. Obese women have an increased risk for uterine atony with subsequent postpartum hemorrhage. However, assessment of the fundus is difficult in this population. Monitor these women frequently for other signs of uterine atony and attempt to assess the uterine fundus while watching for increased lochia flow or clots to be expelled. Remember to check under the woman's legs, buttocks, and back for lochia drainage by asking the woman to turn on her side. Although bleeding may be profuse and dramatic, a continuing small but steady trickle also may lead to significant blood loss that becomes increasingly life-threatening. 
It is difficult to estimate the volume of lochia by visual examination of parapads. More accurate information is obtained by weighing parapads, linen savers, and if necessary, bed linens before and after use and subtracting the difference. One gram of weight equals approximately one milliliter of volume. Measure vital signs at least every 15 minutes or more, often if necessary. Apply a pulse oximeter to determine oxygen saturation levels. Because the body initially compensates for excessive bleeding by constricting the peripheral blood vessels and shunting blood to vital organs, the vital signs may remain normal at first, even though the woman is becoming hypovolemic. The skin should be warm and dry. Mucous membranes of the lips and mouth should be pink, and capillary return should occur within three seconds when the nails are blanched. These signs confirm adequate circulating volume to perfuse the peripheral tissue. Trauma. If the fundus is firm but bleeding is excessive, the cause may be lacerations of the cervix or birth canal. Inspect the perineum to determine whether a laceration is visible. Lacerations of the cervix or vagina are not visible, but bleeding in the presence of a firmly contracted uterus suggests a laceration. This warrants examination of the vaginal walls and the cervix by the healthcare provider. Assess comfort level. If the mother complains of deep, severe pelvic or rectal pain, or if vital signs or skin changes suggest hemorrhage, but excessive bleeding is not obvious, the cause may be concealed bleeding and the formation of a hematoma. Examine the vulva for bulging masses or discoloration. However, a hematoma developing in the vagina or in the retroperitoneal area may not be obvious when the vulva is examined. Table 18.1 summarizes assessments, abnormal signs and symptoms, and nursing implications for postpartum hemorrhage. Identification of patient problems. Inadequate fluid volume and reduced tissue perfusion are examples of problems faced by a woman with postpartum hemorrhage. These problems require a team approach to prevent further complications such as hypovolemic shock. Planning expected outcomes. Hemorrhage requires an interprofessional approach. Therefore, the nursing plan of care will reflect both dependent and independent nursing care. Planning should reflect the nurse's responsibility to do the following. Monitor for signs of postpartum hemorrhage. Perform actions that minimize postpartum hemorrhage and prevent hypovolemic shock. Notify the provider if signs of excessive blood loss are observed or if the woman does not respond as desired. Interventions. Preventing hemorrhage. The key to successful management of early postpartum hemorrhage is early recognition and response. All postpartum women are at risk for hemorrhage. However, be aware of factors that increase this risk further and be particularly vigilant in monitoring these women so that excessive bleeding can be anticipated and minimized. When predisposing factors are present, initiate frequent assessments. Many hospitals and birth centers have a protocol that calls for assessments every 15 minutes during the first hour after birth, every 30 minutes for the next two hours, and hourly for the next four hours. This plan may not be adequate for the woman at known risk for postpartum hemorrhage. A delay in assessment could result in excessive blood loss. Collaborating with the healthcare provider. When excessive bleeding is suspected and the fundus is boggy, begin uterine massage. Check the woman's bladder for distension and have her empty it if necessary. If she is not able to void and the bladder is distended, obtain an order and catheterize the woman. Weigh blood-soaked pads, linen savers, and linens to accurately determine the amount of blood lost. If massage is not effective in controlling bleeding promptly, notify the provider. Save any tissue or clots past. Follow facility protocols to initiate specific laboratory studies, such as hemoglobin and hematocrit levels, and type and cross-match of blood, so that blood is available should transfusions become necessary. Coagulation studies that may be ordered include fibrinogen, prothrombin time, partial thromboplastin time, fibrin split products, fibrin degradation products, platelets, D-dimer, and blood chemistry. Many protocols also allow the nurse to increase the flow rate of an existing IV line or insert a large bore IV catheter to start fluids while the healthcare provider is being informed of the mother's condition. These actions do not substitute for notifying the provider, but they do allow nurses to make initial interventions quickly. Keep the woman on bed rest to increase venous return and maintain cardiac output. The full Trendelenburg's position may interfere with cardiac and pulmonary function and is not advised. 
a modified Trendelenburg's position may be used with the legs elevated 10 to 30 degrees to increase blood return from the legs, the trunk horizontal, and the head slightly elevated. Continue assessments, call for assistance, and save all blood-soaked materials so an accurate estimation of blood loss can be made. Assistance is necessary. One nurse should continue to massage the uterus and perform and record assessments while another notifies the health care provider of the mother's condition and gathers medications and supplies needed. Administer medications, fluids, and treatments as ordered by the healthcare provider or as stated in the facility's protocol. Evaluate the effect and relay the information to the provider. Because of oxytocin's anti-diuretic effect, listen to breath sounds to identify signs of pulmonary edema from fluid overload if large amounts of oxytocin are given. Document blood pressure if methyl organabine is given. If measures fail to control bleeding, notify the healthcare provider so additional procedures can be initiated. These may include preparation for operative intervention. Providing support for the family. The unusual activity of the hospital staff may make the mother and her family anxious. Be alert to their nonverbal cues and acknowledge their feelings when they appear frightened. Keeping the family informed is one of the most effective ways of reducing anxiety. Acknowledge the anxiety and provide simple appropriate explanations of the activity. I know all this activity must be frightening. She is bleeding a little more than we would like, and we are doing several things at once. Post-hemorrhage care. After the hemorrhage is controlled, continue to assess the woman frequently for a resumption of bleeding. The woman may be anemic and fatigued. Allow rest periods and organized work to help her conserve energy. Because the woman may experience orthostatic hypotension, assist her in getting out of bed after dangling her legs and assess for dizziness and low blood pressure. Encourage intake of fluids and foods high in iron. She may need assistance feeding her newborn. Home care. Nurses who work in home care or nurse-managed postpartum clinics should be aware that women who have had postpartum hemorrhage are subject to a variety of complications. In general, they are exhausted. It may take weeks for them to feel well again. Anemia often results, and a course of iron therapy may be prescribed to restore hemoglobin levels. Activity may be restricted until strength returns. Some women need extra assistance with housework and care of the new infant. Fatigue may interfere with attachment. Because extensive blood loss increases the risk for postpartum infection, the woman should be taught to observe for specific signs and symptoms. Evaluation the nurse collects and evaluates data with established norms and judges whether the data are within normal limits. If problems arise, the nurse acts to minimize hemorrhage and notifies the health care provider. Thromboembolic disorders. A thrombus is a collection of blood factors, primarily platelets and fibrin, on a vessel wall. Thrombophlebitis occurs when the vessel wall develops an inflammatory response to the thrombus. This further occludes the vessel. An embolus is a mass that may be composed of a thrombus or amniotic fluid released into the bloodstream that may cause obstruction of capillary beds in another part of the body, frequently the lungs. A pulmonary embolus is a potentially fatal complication that occurs when the pulmonary artery is obstructed by a blood clot that was swept into circulation from a vein or by amniotic fluid. The three most common thromboembolisms encountered during pregnancy and the postpartum period are superficial venous thrombophlebitis, SVT, deep vein thrombosis, DVT, and occasional pulmonary embolism, PE. SVT generally involves the saphenous vein system and is confined to the lower leg. DVT can involve veins from the foot to the iliofemoral region. It is a major concern because it predisposes to PE. Incidence and Etiology Approximately 1 per 1,000 pregnancies are complicated by thromboembolic events. Thrombi can form whenever the flow of blood is impeded. Once started, the thrombus can enlarge with successive layering of platelets, fibrin, and blood cells as the blood flows past the clot. Thrombus formation is often associated with thrombophlebitis. The three major causes of thrombosis are venous stasis, hypercoagulable blood, an injury to the endothelial surface, the innermost layer, of the blood vessel. Two of these conditions, venous stasis and hypercoagulable blood, are present in all pregnancies. The third, blood vessel injury, 
is likely to occur during birth. Venous stasis. During pregnancy, compression of the large vessels of the leg and pelvis by the enlarging uterus causes venous stasis. Stasis is most pronounced when the pregnant woman stands for prolonged periods. It results in dilated vessels that increase the potential for continued postpartum pooling of blood. Relative inactivity and activity restrictions because of complications during pregnancy lead to venous pooling and stasis of blood in the lower extremities. Prolonged time in stirrups or birth and repair of the episiotomy also may promote venous stasis and increase the risk for thrombus formation. Hypercoagulation. Pregnancy is characterized by changes in the coagulation and fibrinolytic systems that persist into the postpartum period. During pregnancy, the level of many coagulation factors are elevated. In addition, the fibrinolytic system, which causes clots to disintegrate, lice, is suppressed. The result is that factors that promote clot formation are increased, and factors that prevent clot formation are decreased. To prevent maternal hemorrhage, resulting in a higher risk for thrombus formation during pregnancy and the postpartum period, 